that includes gun, gang violence, police brutality, intrafamilial and interpersonal violence, as well as subsequent black on black homicides. In fact, black men between the ages of 15 to 24 are seven times more likely to be murdered than white males the same age. The trauma is tremendous, it's horrendous. I did a session at one point in time, I'm doing a session and I'm looking at a black male crying. And he's drawing and he's scraping on the paper. And as he scrapes on the paper, tears are falling on the paper. And when I ask, why are you crying? After the session, he talked to me and he talked about the witnessing of a homicide and the pain that he feels inside. So it is real. What you came out to support today is real. So as we look at it, and we confront the factors that impact on black men's mental health, we look at the response to trauma and vicarious trauma for most black men can be complicated. It escalates to problematic proportions in the severity or duration of symptoms. It can involve social dysfunction. I mean, when you look, when you look at boondocks and you look at some of the shows and they say that they mimic and use the derogatory word in, in the show and say that we are having a nigger moment. And, and we, we, we learn to even call ourselves the word. And we never basically take time to understand the effects of that type of trauma. In some cases, there is severe mental disorganization that goes untreated and develops to more serious mental disorders. Like, I don't even call myself a Negro again. No. When Malcolm X had taught way before that the word Negro comes from a long word, necropolis, something that is dead. And you take on the self-fulfilling prophecy at times, and before you know it, your trauma, your vicarious trauma in observing other individual behaviors, taking on the feelings of other individual behaviors, how they act, how they talk, and what they do. And as black men, you are affected in a vicarious way. So we cannot do justice to, the, to this major topic today with black men the illness, the mental illness that has come to us in our community. But we would attempt. Your parents, the, the, the way that we have been parented, they themselves sometimes don't know. When I was leaving Trinidad at the age of 21, my elder, eldest brother said, hey, listen, go hug your mom and say bye. She said, you go ahead. We learn to take it like a man. I never cried. But when my brother left Canada, I, I, I sat in the parking lot all alone and cried. We learn to take it like a man. We, we, we have the mental pain that grows with us. Culture and history frame experiences and expectations when it comes to the way most black men respond to mental distress, and this places men at a disadvantage when it comes to their mental health. Socialization, how the environment impacts you and vice versa. And we are impacted all the time. Socialization in the male role means learning to control one's emotions, and this repression of emotions when Coping with mental distress leads some men to deny that they are fearful, not react outwardly to pain, hide their depression, and sometimes express anger as a release. So we, we never learn as black men to articulate feelings. I feel sad today. When you reach to your wife or your friend and say, I feel frustrated today. And I feel so angry and I want to talk about, no, you hide and you play around the feeling words. And we do that as black men. 
But the thing is, when anger is more socially acceptable, and you choose to talk about your angry outburst, and, and you're not getting into the feeling words. Not at all. Most men are more comfortable dealing with mental distress cognitively, for example, by talking about the circumstances that cause their distress, but not their feelings about the situation. Hey Dave, am I 20 minutes yet? <laughs> so take, take it like a man, take, take it like a man has been known. You know, with, with this slide, my vice president was able to alert me that it is right at Jane and Wilson, some apartment at Jane and Wilson. Here you have, no, I wouldn't say the words. You guys can read it. But the thing is, it's written up on the apartment building. So this microaggression the microaggression is defined by psychiatrist Dr. Chester Pierce as brief and commonplace daily verbal behavior or environmental indignities. It's like a, when Obama won, you had a, a group of grade nines um, down there at a school in Chincuzi in Brampton, and a supply teacher, Caucasian, came into the class and, and she said, the people of America voted with their uh, hearts and not their mind. And those little grade nine boys got up, they threw chairs, they got so angry. The, the, the microaggression that we talk about, it is real. And sometimes it grows from the micro to the macro. So yes, it, will need a, it would need to be addressed. And the related factors, the social vulnerabilities that impact the mental health of black men is multi-layered. And this is why we don't even have time to deal with it. Well, we know that poverty breeds a host of ramifications. We know that. And at times, it gets to us. Statistically, you see a wage differential of 19% is evident between black men and men who are not members of a visible minority group. So if we were to address the poverty, it would be in the, the, the entire presentation. Talk about the education. In the early 1990s, George J. Sifa, the led a long time Tudinal study examining black youths and the Ontario public school system. We concluded that the term push out was more appropriate than drop out. So service providers, parents, a, a big job. The school to prison pipeline, I mean, it still exists. I mean, we know that the, the, prison, the code of the prison system it was given to the school system from uniform everything. Those who are all like me with no in Trinidad, you go hands up, and that's in school. Hands up, out, up, out, fingernails. And they check your fingernails. And I grew under the system where you get under 70 in math, you are whipped. And that was the system. But, the, but Michael Foucault would, would argue that, that the whole idea of the prison system, it is something that they took from, we had the control exam in the Caribbean that we call the common entrance exam. But our getting into trouble at school is often the first slip into the school to prison pipeline. The criminal justice system, the criminalization of black men with mental illness. Black people only make up 2.5% of Canada's population, but there has been a 69% increase of black males in federal prison over the last 10 years. I remember again, I'm here 26 years. I never had a criminal record. But yet I'm coming out of an apartment in Brampton, and I heard, put your hands and your head up against the car. So wait a minute, could we search your car? Say, so you have the power, not the right. <laughs> yeah. 
Now I tell you, it's a long story. But as I wrap the presentation up in this short moment, I want more. <laughs> I wouldn't get into this slide, and you all could have the slide. You guys have to please link with my vice president and my president and get the slides. Okay. Now, when you talk about black men's experience seeking mental health services, over medication, chloropromazine, and all the others, I cannot this verbalize. But when you talk about over-medication, most black men with mental illness do not access treatment until it is too late, and their pathway to care can be traumatic. Black men make up almost 90% of the forensic clients in the mental health system, despite black people making up only 2.5% of the population. That is serious. Now, I want to wrap the presentation up. We will talk about moving forward. A while ago, in retrospect to the slide that was sent to my vice president, KKK, go home, so and so. In 1916, when Marcus Musaya Gave walked in to America, Booker T. Washington was dead. Marcus Gave kicked a book called Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington. If you ever see the movie Antoine Fisher, look at it. You're going to see what black men go through. And you're going to see Denzel Washington into the hands of the guy he was doing that therapeutic intervention with. But the thing is, Gave had to champion the cause all alone. And he would ask us, could you do it? Could you do it? If we cannot do it, we're a bunch of lazy, lazy good-for-nothings. And in a fast-tempo speech, Gave would do that. And nine million people came together in a short space of time. Black physicists, chemists, even on College Street, they had a branch. As I close, I say to you all I know, I want to quote from Frederick Douglass. The struggle, the, the service providers, uh, Black Health Alliance, uh, I'm thankful for them in, in bringing such a forum. But I want to say to them, that we also must remember, and you all most also must remember, the quote from this social activist in 1857, when this social activist wanted to bring change to black men also. And he said, hey, this is a struggle, and it might be a long one. And you cannot expect crops without plowing. You cannot expect the ocean without its mighty roar. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I will allow for a maximum of four questions this time. <laughs> I'll start from over there. Straight and go ahead. Thank you for that presentation. I was just going to say, uh, one thing that was really interesting to me is um, when we talk about mental illness and mental health, and particularly within you know, the context of the black male, um, it, I, I think one of the things that we struggle with before we even get to, 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 to discuss notions of health is talking about questions of black masculinity. Mm -hmm. And I want to know if you can speak and talk about that at all. And even querying some of the figures that we look to as examples um, uh, who you know, reinforce uh, patriarchy. And uh, you know a lot of I just I, I just want to hear some of your some how you how you uh, uh, speak to the intersection between masculinity and our health and how we uh, see ourselves as, as black men. Well, time would not allow me, but the social construction, <laughs> the social construction, in regards to our makeup as men, it really needs some therapeutic intervention. You know, as I said, I never cried. It had nothing like crying. I grew up in a place where I have to fight at the stand pipe. You don't fill that water before me. <laughs> when my mom sent me to, play the, to learn the piano, and my elder brother said, Derek is a girl. And I came home and said, Mom, I ain't going to learn nothing like piano again. 
it still comes with us today. So we need the therapeutic, we need the services to challenge that misconception of our whole masculine ideology. But we can speak more to it, please, I, time. Um, my question um, sorry, just hold on a second, I'm gonna go to the... I'm not sure if this is actually a question or a comment, but I'll try and form it to the question. I think you have a feeling, of, or sort of like picking up through this talk to what people are saying, is that there's, in, within itself, like within our history, there's therapy. Because for a lot of us, like, you don't grow up like knowing, you know, what your history is. You don't grow up knowing like figures within black history in itself. And so you don't feel a lot of sort of like self-confidence with who you are as a black individual. Like there's a sort of a lot of like, okay, so this is what we did in our history. And I feel like, oh no, I guess maybe my question is, how, what can we do to sort of like better our, self, our sense of self-esteem for black individuals? Oh, oh, he's going into the wrong table. Um, <laughs> Well, we heard it, well, the question with patriarchy and your, I mean, the very naming and renaming, we know that colonization was also involved with words. His story, history, you know? So, so there's so much work to be done in regards to the historical amnesia that we face. And there are times there is a lot of uncomfortable feelings when we are really open and honest. You know, so I totally agree with you that we have much more work to do with really giving individuals their history. Actually, last week I spoke to a sergeant and the topic came up and he said, black people sold black people into slavery. Sure, black that was market, where the term black market aspect, Who organized and financed slavery. So we need to be really knowledgeable in regards to where we came from and where we are going. I will allow the question over there.